Hello, I'm Katie Manning, and you're listening to The Sirens of Audio, you lucky people. <laughs> oh, yes, quite so. Yes, of course, I do know the medium. G'day audiophiles, you're listening to the Sirens of Audio, the podcast that explores the universe of Doctor Who in the audio medium. My name's Dwayne. And my name is Philip. G'day Dwayne, g'day audiophiles. Ah, oh, g'day Philip. We've got a really bad one today, just for a change. No, it's not bad at all. They're all good, aren't they? They're all, they're all great. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, we're going to be speaking later on with the incredible John Colshaw, who... For us Doctor Who fans of late has been recreating the voice of Brigadier Alistair Gordon Lethbridge Stewart on audio, doing a wonderful, wonderful job. And it's been uh, great to talk to him and we're very much looking forward to sharing that, Philip. We are indeed. He's also been doing some pretty fantastic masterwork too in um Time Lord Victoria series and some other things as well. Of course, of course. Oh, and also if you are following us on social media, give us a like. Send us a comment. Send us your feedback. We love to hear what you're thinking. Uh, also, if you're following us on YouTube, uh, make sure you subscribe, hit the like button, hit the notification bell. Um, it will help you get more episodes from us and it will also help other people hear what we have to say about our favourite subject, Doctor Who Audio. Yes, please support us. Go give us a five-star rating and a review. That makes a huge difference. Okay, before we get to the main part of our episode, you know what I see up ahead, Philip? Do you know? No, I don't. What do you see up ahead, Dwayne? Well, let me tell you. It's a rabbit hole. Here we go. Me, me. <laughs> right. Here we are, Philip. It's not very often that we record so close to the episode being released, but the new episode of Doctor Who, or the new series of Doctor Who, has uh, started this week. So that's exciting. It's always exciting when new Doctor Who appears on the television. And um, it got me thinking, because throughout the history of Doctor Who, there are paths that it goes that you're not too happy with or you weren't expecting. And that's certainly been the case for me. Uh, with uh, the last couple of years of, of Doctor Who. But what I want to ask you about is, are there certain pathways that Doctor Who started to take uh, years ago that uh, you've never had resolved? So I'm thinking about resolutions. Let's talk about the classic series. So for me, for instance, I'm always curious to know what might have happened post Roger Delgado. So the, the the story was that Barry Letts was going to have the Doctor and the Master as brothers. There was going to be this big story that was going to be was that that was going to be the regeneration story, wasn't it? For it the was, third Doctor, as the plan to end the Third Doctor. Yeah. So uh, so that's one of them. Uh, anything of yours spring to mind? Oh, another actually. Before you answer that, let me think of another one that sprung to my mind. I was very excited in season twenty five when. Silver Nemesis finished with Doctor Who, who are you? And I, how old was I at the time? I was in my early to mid-teens. So, yes, I was very interested in where they were going to go with this with this uh, scenario. Are we finally going to find out all the details of where the Doctor came from? So I was excited about that too. What about yourself, Philip? Well, I was always curious in terms of the whole Paul McGann era that had the movie been more popular and a series been commissioned... What would the first season have looked like? To, what, what would a season of Paul McCann have been? Because, yeah, the, yeah, it, it, that, that itself would have been very interesting to see what, what the show would have become uh, at that point. And, of course, that would have taken us down a very different route. We wouldn't be where we are now had that been successful. Because they were talking of redesigning the Daleks and everything, weren't they? 
Yeah, there were. Total the redesign. Other... So spider Daleks. Is that when the spider Daleks were? No, those were the thing? Dark Dimensions, I think. Okay, that was a bit earlier. Uh, yes, the Dark Dimension was for the 30th anniversary, wasn't it? Yes. See, there, there's another one too. So we've got the Dark Dimension, which was never made. Uh, so that could have been interesting to see on television as well, as opposed to the other thing that we got. Yes, which I, I still think is <laughs> a lot of fun and I don't mind it. It's okay. <laughs> um, another part is interesting I would have loved to see was because John Nathan Turner was really keen to bring back either Sarah Jane Smith or Leela for the Tom Baker regeneration into Peter Davison and, and bring back a, a, an established one to help transition over. I, I, I'd be fascinated to know what it would have been like had Leela rejoined the TARDIS or had Sarah Jane rejoined the TARDIS for a couple of seasons or a few episodes anyway. And I guess they wouldn't have brought in Janet Fielding, so we, we would have lost her. So there, there's little things, scenarios like that. I mean, what would have, I would have loved to know what would have happened had Sarah Jane, the first Sarah Jane and K9 show been a bigger hit. It, well, it, yeah, the problem was, it was you know, written badly. It, wasn't, it didn't get the right beginnings. But you know, a whole season of Sarah Jane and K9 back in the 80s. Yeah. What what they they look like. So there's lots of paths not taken, which would have been fascinating to see. Lots and lots of paths. Well, speaking of Leela, wasn't she supposed to be in Ark of Infinity? There was talk about her being in that as well and appearing, yes. And she wasn't available? Am I getting that wrong or...? Uh, I don't know. We need to ask Lou next time she's on board. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah, so they're they're just a few things that uh, cropped up uh, in my mind, and I'd be curious to know, uh, viewers and listeners, what your uh, unrealised expectations might be. So drop us a comment or send us an email, whatever you like. Love to hear them, and we'll we'll even read them out for you on a future podcast. So how does that sound? Sounds great. All right, let's dive back up out of the rabbit hole. We'll be back with John Colshaw in just a sec. From Big Finish Productions. The soft shine of the glass caught another creature, an immaculate bearded figure, carrying a blue cylinder under one arm. The Master. Doctor Who, Time Lord Victorious. Short trips, Master Thief. You had the most glowing recommendation, she told him. The Advocate General is a good friend, he demurred. In fact, the master had met the old woman just once, for all of five minutes. She recommended you, too. I mean, the repository. Your personal service. Turning a corner, two guards stood in his way. They raised their weapons as the master raised his. Their screams reverberated down the dark passageway. More guards came running to intercept, but he cut them down without mercy. You will obey me. Lesser evils. Death descended on the planet Alexis, one bright and crisp, clear morning. The Katuru now bent and placed her hands on top of the dense litter of the forest floor. The creatures of and in the ground were drawn to her warmth and power. They came to her voluntarily. She brushed the carapace of a tiny globular bug and constrained it to a lifespan of weeks. A most intriguing species, said the man in black velvet. The woman didn't flinch, but incredibly, she hadn't known he was there. I take it, he said agreeably, eyes now on the woman, that I have the pleasure of addressing the due representative of the all-hallowed Katuru. I am your humble servant. He bowed, though there was something playful, insincere in his movement. Did he dare to mock her? Now that I have your attention. (laughs) Big finish. We love stories. Lots of people are known for being uh, um, very famous with different characters. Uh, there's the Man of a Thousand Faces, but we're interviewing today John Colshaw, Man of a Thousand Voices. John, welcome to Sirens of Audio. Hello there. Great to talk to you, and uh, thanks, for, thanks for having me on. And thank you for all your kind words along the way. Always much appreciated. Oh, well, it's our pleasure. Now, where, where are you speaking to us from today? Uh, from London today. Um, 
here in the morning, evening for you. I love time zones. They still fascinate and bamboozle me. Um, so, yes, uh, speaking to you from uh, from London town this morning. So where, where's, you, where's your usual place of residence? Usually, uh, I live in Lancashire in the northwest of England. Uh, that's home for me. Uh, that was where I first watched Doctor Who when I was about three or four years old. Uh, the Pertwee era. I was very much a Pertwee child. Um, and yeah, that's where I all started off. Do you remember the first episode that you saw, John? I think the first episode, I think it might have been The Demons. I think it was The Demons. And I can remember Bok the Gargoyle, which reminded me of some of the stone statues which were in the local churchyard. There were statues like Bok, uh, Bok or Weeping Angels. And that sort of resonated in that that fearful sense that you enjoy. Uh, and I just remember the third doctor being so paternal, very heroic when faced with the alien, when faced with the, with the creatures, he knew exactly what to do. This instinct would click in and he knew exactly what to do. And just that sense that the doctor was very paternal and would look after you. Um, you were safe so long as the doctor was there. Um, and that, that was, that was wonderful. That, that's the, the third doctor was my first doctor. So was Doctor Who something your whole family got into, or was it just something that you got pretty obsessed by yourself? Oh, I think the whole family liked it. My, my brother, Jim is 15 years older than me. Uh, and he watched, uh, from the Hartnell era, um, and, and the Patrick Troughton era too. So I would ask him about what it was like then. And he would tell me about these other worlds of Doctor Who that I hadn't experienced yet because I wasn't old enough. Um, and we'd watch the third Doctor episodes together. Um, and so when the time of the three Doctors came and we could see all of those profound characters together interacting, that really was fantastic. That, that was um, an astonishingly wonderful thing to watch. When you four, I was four years old when the, the, the three doctors first appeared. And it's one of those stories I always re-watch over and over and over again. I've got about five or six that I watch over and over and over and always will, I think. What are the others? Some of the others? Um, Pyramids of Mars, The Time Warrior, uh, The Sea Devils. Um, what else? What else? What else? Death to the Daleks. I'm very fond of Death to the Daleks. Um, and Inferno, Planet of the Spiders, The Android Invasion. Endless, endless tales. But yes, the third and the fourth Doctor era um, when I was growing up. Those were the ones. So we know and love you from your Doctor Who work, but you're most famous originally for voice work. So when was it that you started to realise you had this ability just to create voices and duplicate voices? I think where I grew up in Lancashire, there were so many characters around, um, you know, who spoke in this broad sort of way, like, like, you know, and you just couldn't resist being a mischievous youngster. You just had to copy them and recreate their voices. And it made everybody laugh. It seemed to make everybody happy. So that egged me on a bit. Um, my teachers were full of character as well. So I was the, you know, the, the, the class impersonator um, and always would take off the teachers in a benevolent way, they, in a way that they enjoyed. Um, and it was really just like that. Um, watching the Mike Yarwood show over here on a Saturday night in the, uh, in the early and mid 70s. Um, and it was just uh, doing voices and creating voices and characters was part mischief, part enjoyment, inspired by the, the people who grew up around me so when you left school what was your goal in life to be when i left i didn't really know what i wanted to do when i left school i knew what i didn't want to do i knew that uh, if i worked in a bank or an office I, I would have been disastrous i would i would have been a bit like boris johnson is as prime minister you know completely hapless and just a tumbling ball of random. Uh, I don't think I would have, um, my mind doesn't really work in that way. I would have been like Frank Spencer or Stan Laurel. 
um, I, I knew that my, my career would be in some area of performance or some area of, um, of, of the arts in some way. So I volunteered on the local hospital radio station. Uh, and I thought, I'll start off in radio and I'll take it from there and I'll, I'll see where that leads. So that, that, that was really the beginning of um, giving my head some sort of professional application and looking to the future. So the radio, the radio station was just in the hospital or was it broader than that? Yes, it was just in the hospital. This was in 1986. Uh, I was 17 by this time. And the, 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 it was called Radio Ormskirk General, uh, the hospital radio station. And it came from sort of a grey porter cabin. Uh, and the signal was connected along something that looked like a washing line, which connected the station to the main building of the hospital. And that's where all those 80s hits would transmit across um and yeah that was that that was it it was a gray box it was like a, a sort of building you might have seen in the alternative universe in inferno <laughs> it was very gray and blocky it would have been very a very good place to uh, to put um a, a gunfight between ogrons and draconians <laughs> it, it looked like that do you bring everything back to doctor who somehow <laughs> Uh, yeah, for our chat, I am, yes. But <laughs> in life, in, in life, I think I, I, I do as well, yes. I do, there's always, you know those phrases, you know, there's always a phrase you can pick up from the show and you can use it, you can just slot it in uh, to everyday life in, in some way. I'm just trying to think of them. A, a mate of mine is um, a theoretical physicist, Dr. Paul Abel, and he has great knowledge of Doctor Who and all of the phrases. And we, we, we'll, we'll crowbar all sorts of conversations into the, um, all sorts of phrases into the, into the conversation. Um, fight it, Belal, fight it. I heard you say, Doctor, while well, we were that fellow's heels. <laughs> but where are the functionaries? Fetch them, fetch them. Any old random thing like that that just makes you smile and is quirky. It's never far from, never far from the mind. <laughs> so after your time in the, hosp the hospital radio show, uh, where did you go to next? From the hospital radio show, I started making lots of demo cassettes, lots of showreels, which was the, uh, the, the formula at the time. That was the hardware that was, uh, that was used at the time, cassettes. And I'd record shows and I'd send them off. And eventually um, I managed to get a job on Red Rose Radio in Preston, a regional station. Uh, across Lancashire, um, and uh, I would I would do the graveyard shift. I would do two till six in the morning on Red Rose Radio, and then I'd stay on um, for the breakfast show, where I would uh, compile the traffic and travel and read it out uh, for the breakfast show presenter. And this was, uh, I was 19 when I was doing that. And occasionally then, I'd be doing the shows and... I might just pepper the, the overnight show that I did with a few voices here and there, just as a bit of a party trick and just as a bit of a novelty. Um, I'd impersonate Frank Bruno, Bob Geldof, and just sprinkle them through the show wherever it came to mind. So, yeah, that was, that was the next step after the hospital station, moving across to Red Rose in Preston. So the programme that I know you from in Australia is Spitting Images, but that's still a, oh, yeah. a while... That's still a while off before. How old were you when you started doing spitting images? Yes, that was when I was uh, 23. 1994, that was. Yes, spitting image. I would travel to London twice a week. You'd do the non-topical jokes and sketches on the Tuesday, and the more topical ones you'd do on the Friday. Um, and they would be made ready for the Sunday show. And if something really topical happened if some news broke on Sunday occasionally you would do a quick sketch just then to cover it um but yeah that was my first job on television spitting image um when I was 23 and once again I, I sent in just like I had for the radio stations I sent in a cassette um and it all it all started I I was uh, I was working at Viking Radio in Hull in East Yorkshire and I interviewed the great Lenny Henry 
who was doing a, a show uh, at the whole new theatre. And I interviewed him about that. And we just got talking about voices. And he went into his wonderful array of, of characters. And we were sort of like playing about on the air. And he, he, he said to me, he said, right, record some of these voices you're doing and send them into Spitting Image. They're always looking for people. So it was on Lenny's advice. And um, so I sent, I sent some material in. And at the time that Steve Coogan moved on from the show, um, it left a gap. And so that was when myself and Alistair McGowan joined the show. And yes, I was 23 at the time. Yeah. Spitting image. It was, uh, it was a, a great way of uh, finding out what was going on in the news. Not watching the news, just listen to the spitting image sketches. It was probably better than the news in some ways. <laughs> Exceedingly. So you had this amazing array of voices, I mean, I, I, goodness knows, do you, do you know how many voices you have? Have you ever counted them? Sometimes you can count them. You, you perhaps use 50 topical ones at any one time. But if you were to count up every one that went in every which direction, I don't know. I think some impersonators say it runs into hundreds, maybe about 350, something like that. If you counted them all up, including, you know, your Uncle Brian, Wurzel Gummidge, any which way you'd wish to go. You, you could end up at a figure like that, I suppose. So what, what do you think it is that gives you the skill to do this? Is it an ear thing? Is it a, how, do, how do you create a voice? It's very mysterious. It's quite hard to explain. A lot of it is just instinctive, I think. A lot of it is just a sense of knowing when you're getting close to the, the, the tone of the voice, but also the essence of the person. What you see in here is almost the last thing you do. The, 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 the main chunk of it is just about the energy of that person. So that um, you, you just capture their, you capture their spirit and their drive and everything that's identifiable about them. And then uh, just add on the top coat of the voice, sounding as it should be. And hopefully, hopefully you get there. And then the more you do it, the more it runs in, the more... It becomes smooth and established, and that, that that's where you want to get to with the, with, with those characters. So, do you know how you do it, or is it just instinct for you? You can feel when the instinct is starting to work, but to get there, what you have to do first is lots of listening, lots of watching of YouTube clips, and just um, don't really go into a scrutinising mode. First of all, just watch and watch and watch and see what washes over you. See what sticks to your instinct. Um, and then there's a stage after that, a bit like learning a new language. Listen, repeat, listen, repeat. And then you can try it out on, on some friends, maybe drop in the odd catchphrase here and there, see if they react. Also, it's important to know when to leave it, when to just turn away. And just let your subconscious just percolate with what you've watched and just let it sit there. I think that's why I love to do the Doctor Who characters so much, because I've watched them all my life, all my days, um, and just watched and enjoyed without trying to learn them as such. So when you come to have to do um, a target novelization or a big Finnish audio drama, it, it's lovely the way that they are just there. Um, so, yes, that's, that's very rewarding indeed. Lots of people uh, seem to impersonate Tom Baker really well. He's such a unique voice. Uh, yeah. Does that make him easy to impersonate? Or uh, are there, is everyone sort of on the same level when it comes to picking up their mannerisms? I think, I, he's, I mean, he's so distinctive so powerful and that's uh that eccentricity you know that amazing eccentricity that you hear and those wide eyes and that great velvety boom i find it very interesting when tom is talking uh as an actor and talking about many plays he's done and people he's worked with um yes head a gardener <laughs> oh there's just something so joyful to relish in with that and whenever anybody impersonates Tom Beck, you find there's always that power there. There's always that great eccentricity. 
there's always that sense of any words that you say in that voice, it will just sound, it will just sound marvelous. Any word, the sirens of audio, you see, <laughs> it just gives that uh, that wonderful velvety boom. Um, anyone who impersonates Tom will have that sense of power at the heart of it, power and eccentricity. You just seem to switch into a voice immediately. No, no, how much how much practice do you do to get a voice? So, I mean, Tom, you've been doing for years. That's probably the first voice I would have heard you do. Um, but how how long did it take you to does it take you to perfect a new voice? It might uh, if you're learning a, a topical character for a show like Dead Ringers or uh, something like that. You might just watch, and perhaps two or three days will get you started, um, and you'll be able to deliver it for a topical sketch but the more you do after after two weeks it'll be really settled in there like uh, like a comfortable pair of shoes that you've been walking around in a bit and it starts to feel more natural um after years it just becomes something like that you just click an imaginary switch in the back of your neck and they appear see that person in your mind's eye and they just uh they just appear and Characters like like Tom Baker are very much like that. Just click like that. Uh, whenever I uh, whenever I take on the voice of John Pertwee, I can remember now he has a very sharp resonance. I cross the void beyond the mind, and uh, no syllable is wasted. There's that great warmth. And I think one's body language becomes uh, very much stronger, very more eloquent, uh, very more poised. Um, and they're, they're just so magical. You just see them in the mind's eye and, and the tone of voice follows. I think one of the master classes of uh, audio books you did was The Five Doctors. That reading was, that reading was extraordinary. And it, it's, it just captured me the whole time. Because, I mean, it's one of my, I love the show. It's one of, those, you know, one of the ones I always go to because it's just a feel warm. But listening to you read that and just switch from character to character was extraordinary. Is it, is it hard to be in a studio? How much preparation did you do before that? Do you have, because you're doing so many impersonations, do they give you more time or do you just have to get it out like normal? Yes, you just you just go along like normal. You know, you might just stop and do a bit of a gear change. I recorded that, I think it was 2016, 2017. I listen back to it now and, you know, there's certain voices that are more, settled in now because i've done them more often i'd love to give it another go uh you know a software update sort of a thing um but they, they give you the text uh, a good few months before or a good few weeks before and you just read through you annotate it you mark out where all the characters are um and you, you get familiar with the with the written word you, you get familiar with the, the phrasing and so on. So you're not reading it fresh, brand new for the first time. You, you know the flow of the words. Um, Terence Dix's writing is beautiful to deliver in an audio way because um, Terence Dix had this just this wonderful gift and instinct for just encapsulating the meaning and just bringing it so vividly to life with the most beautiful economy of words. Um, so, so just incredible for that. Uh, and to walk through this amazing story that I, I watched that live as it went out for the first time in 1983. And that, that's another story that I, I go back to time and time again. And just to bring it to life, the chance to live it yourself. You know, I can see the uh, pretty day walking along. I uh, was the second doctor. Yes, we never did bother much about rules, not as I remember. Um, great balls of fire. You know, all the phrases that, uh, uh, don't look down. <laughs> Judge Jeffries, oh, definitely Newton. There's no limit to Isaac's genius. <laughs> Sorry, mustache. They're all there. <laughs> and, um, and to walk through them is a wonderful thing. I consider myself very lucky to have had the chance to do that. The the voice that blew me away with your reading of The Five Doctors was the Anthony Ainley master. Very, very, it was, I, I had to do a double take because it was, it was, it was that good. So uh, when you recently did the, when you recently did the terror of the master, 
uh, or the masterful, masterful you're in, wasn't it? So uh, how, how difficult was Ainley to do? And that, that must have been a joy for you as well. Oh, I, I couldn't believe it when uh, I had the chance to do that one. Brilliantly written by Trevor Baxendale, who knows and loves that Third Doctor unit era so, so well. Um, and it really did feel, I think, like a story that would have occurred somewhere between the, the Green Death and the Time Warrior. And it, it's, it's very interesting in, in those uh, stories, the sort of the differences between those masters, the Delgado master and the Anthony Ainley master. And I always say that um, the Roger Delgado master has um, an ominous sense of brooding, I call it. And the mouth shape, it's very triangular. I am the master and you will obey me, obey me. It takes it into this triangular thing. Whereas the, uh, the Ainley master, Anthony Ainley's portrayal has uh, an elegant malevolence, is how I like to describe that. And rather than being triangular like the Delgado master, it's sort of the shape of the mouth goes over here. One of my predecessors. <laughs> you can get me into the zone. There's those lovely mouth shapes that go on. Um, and that's a lovely difference between them. I always found it uh, fantastic to see the Anthony Ainley master with the third doctor. That was fantastic, you know, given what we know and love about the relationship between the Doctor and the Master, particularly in the Pertwee era, uh, to, to see Anthony Ainley and John Pertwee together. That's why I might have known you did hide all this. For once, I'm here to help you. You help me. I've never heard such nonsense. <laughs> Just really delicious stuff, isn't it? Really delicious. Um, so, yeah, the difference between the two masters, different wavelengths of evil, delicious stuff. Brilliant. Now, the, you first came to Big Finish in 2006 for The Kingmaker. Um, there was yeah. a role, role for Tom Baker. At that stage, Tom Baker wasn't interested in working for Big Finish. So how did you first join Big Finish? Uh, well, that story, The Kingmaker, was written by a great pal of mine, Nev Fountain who uh, is one of the Dead Ringers writers. He's, he's a brilliant, brilliant comedy and satire writer. Uh, and he and his uh, writing partner, Tom Jameson, uh, who's from Australia, uh, they write such a huge amount of the show and always have done in its 22-year history. Uh, and Nev is a fellow Doctor Who fan, and he'd written this story, The Kingmaker, and there was this section where the fifth Doctor hears a recording of that he's made, but during the time of his fourth self. Um, so uh, that just needed uh, recreating and doing. And so, yeah, that was my first uh, big finish story. And then I, re I returned to big finish uh, quite a few years later, just the way it played out. I think it was 2016 when I went back uh, because a great friend of mine is Sylvester McCoy. And we uh, very often will meet up and have a Monday night curry. And Sylvester said, you know, why don't you, why don't you come and do some big Finnish stories? And he, he, he put the word in for me. He said, why don't you come and do a few more? I said, well, I'd love to. Absolutely love to. And I remember uh, Sylvester came to give me a lift to the studios. And <laughs> it was extraordinary because he came along in this rather quirky car that he had at the time. One of those Chrysler land cruisers sort of one of those bubble cars a very quirky looking car it sort of breezed along and then the door opened and inside he, he was playing the music from hms pinafore at huge volume and they said good morning good morning get in get in and off we went and it, it was like being scooped up by the doctor himself and taken off on an adventure and that was uh, that was when i went back to big finish and started doing some more stories with them Yep, you know, that was the You Are the Doctor in 2015. You then did some Avengers as well. Um, yes. But then after that, you came back and actually got to work with Tom Baker. Um, yeah. On, on the Genesis Chamber. 
what was it like being in the same room as Tom? Did he know? Did he know who you were, and that you'd spend so much time ringing up pretending to be him? Oh yes, yes, um, he did. There was one time when I phoned him as him, <laughs> which which appealed to his quirky sense of humour. It was all about a uh, yes. Sorry to cross my own timeline, but, but I'm in grave danger. Really? Oh God! Yes. K9 has been caught fouling the pavement. Oh dear, and somebody tripped on the ball bearings. <laughs> Riffing like that. Um, and we'd recorded a sketch for a show I did called Alter Ego, where I interviewed Tom as Tom, uh, in, in makeup as, as him. Although I looked, I looked quite Patuian, um talking to Tom, but that, that was wonderful. A sketch called Alter Ego, there's a YouTube clip of that. Let's face it, Tom, we've got the best voice in the world, haven't we? <laughs> no, we have, we have. Such is the rich fruitiness of our sumptuous tones <laughs> that we can say any word whatsoever and it will sound magnificent. Go on, then. Here's some we might want to try. Norris McQuirter. Hamilton Academicus. Horsemeat Hippo Burger. Zippity Duda. Romana. I married her, you know. Yes, I remember. Yes, of course, you were there. Well, yes, 1980. Was it really? Yes. We were happy. To be in the, uh, in the same recording studio as, as Tom and Louise Jameson and seeing the wonderful rapport that they have from all those years of working together and all those years that they've known each other, um, to step in alongside that, it's, it's, it's amazing to see just how inventive Tom is and how spontaneous. And he's, he'll sit there uh, with his scripts like that, uh, with a script on a music stand, and the gesticulations are going all around. And he's looking over his glasses, and he's saying, yes, I wonder if we can just put that line there. And um, you are, I think, uh, or... Yes, yeah, so perhaps if I just say that, perhaps if I convey this sort of idea. And he comes up with all these beautiful inventive suggestions. And it's just marvellous being next to that energy. He's in his 80s now, but that energy is still as strong and powerful as ever. And the anecdotes that he tells in the, in the green room between scenes or over the lunch break, the anecdotes are hilarious and outrageous. And just so only he could tell them. Only he could tell them, yes, I was... Uh, Yes, I was a monk, you know. I had, uh, yes, I had a love affair with God. I was a monk for a time. Occasionally, uh, nuns would come to visit us. And uh, not in that way, of course. No, no, just for spiritual enlightenment, you understand. And one very kind nun, she, uh, she had an, an egg, an owl egg, and she incubated it between her bosom. Yes, and then the owl hatched out and was convinced that the nun was its mother. Yes, yes, beautiful the cycles of nature. And he just tells these stories. I can't think of anyone else who could tell a story like that and make it sound plausible. And another really charming thing is um, when John Leeson is in, providing the, uh, the voice of K-9. And once again, just to see that the great friendship and the rapport that Tom and John Leeson have with each other, they've known each other all these years, and they chat with such a happiness and a relaxation. Um, same again, Philip Hinchcliffe was, was there at that time. I mean, it was great being in his company, uh, the, the fellow who, who pr produced Pyramids of Mars, Talons of Wan Chiang, um, and he still has that, that great uh, sense of uh, observation and control over the story and uh, that instinct of a producer. Once again, the great friendship and chat that they all have, just friends reunited. This was all in the 70s, but the moment they're all back together in the same room, click, and they just pick up where they left off. It's, it's ever-present, and it's, uh, I, just, I just stay quiet and sit back and enjoy. And It's, it's, it's a really lovely thing. Now, the first com sort of companion or main character you asked to come back and play extensively was Chameleon. 
Uh, you did a trilogy of chameleon plays. Yeah. Um, where, where did you find your inner... Was it Gerald Flood? Where you'd find your inner Gerald Flood? You were doing a lot of voices for him. Um, what was it like coming back and working with that TARDIS crew? Once again, f- fantastic. Uh, the sense of friendship, it's just so instantly there with uh, with Peter Davison and Janet Fielding and Mark Strickson. The, the, it's just the gang, the gang back together. And their sense of friendship is just so wonderful. That, that energy of people who've known each other for years and been great, great friends for years. That just makes it a joy to begin with. But Chameleon, what a fascinating character. Um, of course, he was bound by the 80s. There's only so much you can do with the 1980s gear levers and a car battery. Um, and I did watch The King's Demons just to get a sense of where Chameleon's voice was in that mode, where he was channeling uh, the character of the king brilliantly brought to life by Gerald Flood, uh, that wonderful medieval f- swirl uh, that he had for that. And it was good to start it with that, I think. And then I think Chameleon being uh, the, 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 the robot that he is, and the settings, I thought the voice would probably eventually work its way back to some sort of default position, ready to morph into the next character that comes along. And looking at that face of Chameleon, a very benevolent face, there's a sort of an innocent expression and that jerky movement that you could imagine, like somebody doing 80s robotics. To me, that said, this kind of electronic voice something quite benevolent, but speaking in a, as if it has been programmed. But the programming is there and has been for many years. Um, Just make it robotic like that, robotic but benevolent. That's the sort of default setting for Chameleon, I think. And those great stories that explored his background and showed his his planet. And Big Finish is so wonderful at, at... providing the, the, the backstory to these characters that we, we haven't seen up to now, uh, the, the, the chance that they have to, to do that. And Chameleon was a f- fabulous character to do that with. That's your home planet. Yes. It is known as Macalian. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, the Chameleon Empire. It must have been abandoned centuries ago. It's overgrown with weeds and vines and whatever this is. Some sort of lichen. This world was once home to a species similar to your own. The Camille. The Camille? They created me and my kind. So what happened to them? Watch out! I'm sorry. I didn't see it. Yeah, but I think they've seen us. What? Oh, yes! Run! 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 Psychokinetic interface restored. Chameleons reactivated. Well done, my little friend. You answered our call and restored us to life. Big finish. We love stories. What was it like being in the studio with Katie? She was another person from uh, your childhood Doctor Who as well. That must have been thrilling yeah. for you. Yeah, she, she's she's amazing. She's one of the most positive people on earth. Uh, she really is. She, she's such, such a bright light. Um, and just... Uh, Adorable to be around, um, an incandescent, lovable energy, and and quite quite brilliant and so generous. Um, and I, I remember watch, watching the Third Doctor era when I was four and five, that sort of age, six. Um, the Third Doctor really reminded me of my dad. Um, they were born the same year. They had a similar sort of look. And uh, my dad had played a lot of sport, cricket, football, boxing, hockey. And 
John Pertwee, very much an active sort of soul like that as well. Loved his motorbikes and been in the Royal Navy. My dad was in the Royal Engineers in World War II. And so John Pertwee reminded me of my dad. Uh, the Brigadier uh, reminded me of my, uh, yes, my Uncle Richard. Uh, that was the uh, that was the parallel that I made. Uh, and Rosemary, my older sister, some of her friends, my, my older sister, she's 11 years older than me. So some of her friends would uh, come by to the house on a Friday night and they'd, they'd go off to um, a, a, a dance or a, a pub or something like that. And Joe was rather like uh, some of the friends that my sister brought around, you know, these like, um, you know, this, these, these uh, really cool girls who you have a bit of a crush on and you go all shy and you blush. Uh, she was a bit like that. Um, and I think uh, Sergeant Benton and Captain Mike Yates, they were a bit like my brother's mates. My, my brother's 15 years older than me and uh, his, his mates were a bit like, um, a bit like Benton and, and Captain Yates. So it's amazing how you could relate it all to your family. And I'd, at the Big Finish recordings, I'd, I'd tell these stories to Katie. And she just loves to hear about what people were doing when they were watching the show, when it was, when it was being transmitted at that time, what it meant to them. I told her a story about how uh, I once painted the corner of my dad's shed uh, white and stuck some paper plates to it so it would look like the TARDIS. <laughs> and I told her that story and she, she found that very charming she did she, she was very encouraging about that yes very encouraging but she's such a bright light Katie she really is one thing that amazed me about your reading of Scourge of the Cybermen was how much of the inflection of Liz Sladen you got in the voice too that what kind of um work did you put into into Sarah Jane Smith and, and getting that as, as well as you did? It was like she was there. Yes, I think, um, you know, some of the target novelizations were Sarah Jane appears, um, Death to the Daleks, The Five Doctors and so on. Um, this is all testament to how brilliantly uh, Liz Sladen created the character of the journalist. She's got this gumption. She's got this strong curiosity. She's got this drive. And really, you just take that energy. You just take that energy and you just run with it. And you just let that sense of character be the thing that pushes through. Um, you know, the, the, the timbre of the voice is, is nothing like my own. Uh, but you, you, you don't even want to try that. Um, it's all about the great curiosity. You know, it's just about that, that gumption, that instinct and that drive. Um, and that's how you, when you've watched these characters all your life, I, I think that the key to it is in, in the reading, you've got to try and invoke the feeling that they made you feel when you first watched them. I think that's, that's what it is. And with, with Sarah Jane, she, she is your best mate with this great instinct. Um, surviving through this story. I love the description that Barry Letts gave uh, to um, Liz Sladen's performance as Sarah Jane, that many actors were able to show being frightened. Many others were able to show being brave. But with Liz Sladen and Sarah Jane, she showed those two at the same time, which is a great thing, isn't it? Isn't, that just shows what a, an ingenious and instinctive performance character she created and i can see it in my mind's eye now when she's being faced with lynx the santaran for the first time and there's that look there she is both terrified and brave at the same time which is beautifully instinctively done it's amazing from big finish productions doctor who the big finish audio novels scourge of the cybermen by simon Gurrier. As she got closer to the dull red glow, she could feel the heat of it, even through her suit. Closer, and the thing became more distinct. A red square affixed to the tunnel wall at waist height. The square panel looked familiar. 
She looked back the way she had come, barely discernible in the gloom. Square panels marked the route at regular intervals, but they did not glow red. Each panel had a circular hole in its center. One panel had a thick cable attached. Plug sockets, said Sarah to herself, except this one. The hole in the glowing red panel was not circular, but ragged. The paneling cracked. Something had broken it, using considerable force. The damage had caused some kind of short circuit. Now the whole panel was hot. Instinctively, Sarah backed away. And fell over something bulky. For a moment, she lay stunned on her back on the hard metal grill. Idiot. More embarrassed than bruised, she sat up. Whatever she'd fallen over moved. Startled, Sarah scampered quickly back, pressing herself against the curved tunnel wall. The thing in the dark huffed and floundered. In the warm red glow from the panel, she couldn't quite see. She would have to get nearer. It was a man. He wore a bulky suit like hers. But without the helmet, his exposed face, red and blotchy in the light from the panel, drenched in sweat. It's all right, Sarah told him, trying to help. It's Mr. Craby, isn't it? I'm Sarah. It's going to be all right. He stared in agony at her, mouth twitching, as he struggled to respond. There's, he said, trying to point further down the tunnel into the dark. But the effort was too much. It exhausted the last of his energy. His hand dropped. His mouth gave one last twitch. And as Sarah watched, he died. There was a release a bit of, uh, almost a year ago now called The Grey Man of the Mountain, where you were playing the Brigadier post Battlefield. And I I swear I noticed that you've put effort into making the Brigadier that older Brigadier. Uh, so you're not doing the same voice throughout the history. You're putting a lot of effort into his actual age as well. Yeah, yes, exactly. Because it, it, it changed so... Um distinctly over time um the, the pomp and full speed of the third doctor's era where um, you know the, the, the brigadier is, is is younger there perhaps 42 something like that and i'm very much at full speed no i do not propose to ignore the matter i'm putting my best man onto it i was just about to brief him when you rang and, and that rivalry with the doctor they're very much thrown together um and that's famous spark but that does mellow as time goes on when we see him back in the time of Mordrin and, and the Five Doctors, ah, there's already that sense of uh, being retired there. You know, pouring a glass of whiskey at the chance to chance of re-meeting old friends. There's more of a reflective side there. There's a sense of all of those years of service and a sense of just um, sitting back and allowing. I think he sits back and he, he'll allow himself a little bit of calmness because no one deserves it more. And then once again, past the, the, the battlefield time, uh, the Brigadier's relationship with the Seventh Doctor is, I mean, they're, they're such great friends of many, many years by this stage. So it's much more mellow. And by this time, I think it's very interesting what's happened to the Brigadier. He has seen so many of the enemies and he has seen so many profoundly unusual things that uh yes that mind is open and there's uh the sense of wisdom that has come in and even more comes a number of unusual things that i have uh, we know it's wise to always keep an open mind and i love how we see that change he, the brigadier matures like a fine whiskey over the decades and it's it is it's just gorgeous from Big Finish Productions.
Doctor Who, the Grey Man of the Mountain. So, what are you doing in this exciting part of the world? Ben McDewey. The mountain? Rumoured to be haunted. Five people have come down that mountain in the past month. Panicked and delusional. It's still following us. There's a shadow in the mist. Don't look back. Two more have gone missing. Mountain rescue can't find them. Whatever's on that mountain can kill. We can't see through the mist. So, we imagine what's out there. What's watching us? What's waiting for us to make the wrong step? If something happens out there, there's no one to help you. You know what we heard? You haven't seen it yet. You can still get away. Where is it? I can't see anything. Help! Whatever you do, don't look at their faces. You made your choice. Get back, Brigadier. Whatever you do, don't look at his face. Big finish. We love stories. Now, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the latest Third Doctor Adventures were released, and you were starring in an episode called The Devil's Hoofprint by Robert Valentine. Mm. Now, yeah. now, in that, the, the Brigadier actually gets a uh, good slice of the action because um, he gets left to the present with his own storyline where the Doctor goes back to the past with a separate storyline. Um, how much more are they trying to throw things at you and challenge you in terms of as an actor and giving the character more things to do, to do, do you think? Yes, I think this is the this is the instinct of the of the writers and and Nick Briggs and David Richardson and everybody, um, just to have the chance of putting the brigadier into new situations, um, and the the chance in the devil's hoofprints there where his story is a bit of a, a separate one. You know, I remember hearing Terence Dix speaking of these things. You know, it's all like it's a way of dividing your story. You see, you know, you go this way and I'll, you go that way. You see, it's a way of dividing your story. Um, and yes, and that the brigadier has some uh, has a storyline on his own where he has to face um, he has to face the, the the character there who is particularly ma- malevolent and foul tempered, um, and it's it's nice to see him coping with that, and it's good to see the sense of the soldier's duty. Yes, I would be prepared to lay down my life for the common good. That is not an instinct we share. Um, to, uh, pulling those sense of um, that sense of duty and conviction, with a lovely flavour of uh, something evocative of, of the demons. So yeah, the the writers do put the brigadier into so many delicious new situations. Delicious playing some scenes with Paul McGann in the Stranded stories, um, and I've had the chance to do the same with Christopher Eccleston, which will be which will be heard next year. Um, and I, 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 I do consider it a, a, a great honour to take the character of the Brigadier and let him be in new stories, new adventures, with, with new companions, doctors who he hasn't worked with before. It, it, it's testament to the eternally brilliant character that Nick Courtney created, that Nick Courtney just shows you exactly how to do it just before faithful to that don't veer away from that just be faithful to that and that will guide you through um i i I think it's um a great testament to the character that he created that people want new new stories with him in new situations with new characters i think nicholas courtney was always so loved that the desire was always to get him to work with every doctor and uh, i know colin baker was missed along the way so when they did dimensions of time they made sure they gave him an opportunity. And of course, when Big Finish started, the, one of the first they did was make sure Paul McGann got to work with Nicholas Courtney. So it's nice, it's nice now that, you know, unfortunately, Nicholas is no longer with us. But the con- tradition continues that every doctor has to meet the Brigadier somewhere along the way. Yes, ex- exactly. It just wouldn't seem right uh, t- to not have that happen. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of... Uh, you know, it, it, it will probably happen with the Tenth Doctor at some stage. It'll, it, it sh- hopefully, it will happen with them all. And it's always a, it's always a beautiful moment when, when one particular Doctor meets the Brigadier for their first time, for the first time of that incarnation. It's rather lovely how the, the Brigadier has the advantage with that. Really, he's seen so many changes, 
and isn't surprised by it at all and quite usual for him now. I have to ask, is there ever any rival rivalry between yourself and, and Tim in the third Doctor sessions? Have you, do you ever have a third Doctor face-off? <laughs> we, we, we do often we, we do often compare the things that uh, we, we've we've noticed, but there's not any rivalry or anything like that. He, he's a great mate, is Tim, and we've got a great rapport, and he, he's so mischievous and hilarious. Um, the Third Doctor is a is a character that I love to do. Um, you know, in the audio novels, Scourge of the Cybermen and Terror of the Master, and all the Target novelizations, it's one that I love to do. But it's also one that I love to hear done. And it's, it's one that I love to play opposite as well and to see it from that side. And so uh, having the chance to do that with Tim is, uh, is fantastic. And um, he, he brings such a lovely warmth and charm uh, to, to the way he plays the, the third doctor. Um, it sort of reminds me of John Pertwee's performance sort of in Paradise of Death or The Ghosts of Endspace, those audio adventures. And I, I, I think a, a testament to Tim's Third Doctor is um, in the anniversary story a few years ago, uh, The Sacrifice of Joe Grant that was part of that anniversary series. And um, in that story, Tim's Third Doctor shows up quite unexpectedly. Sort of, hello, Joe, hello, Joe. He does it in that sort of way. Um, and when I first heard him, when I, when I heard Tim's third doctor appear in that story, I was glad to see him. I was glad to hear it. I felt my soul was warmed. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's why it's good, you see. That's why it's good. So it is one that I love to do. But it's also one that I love to play opposite. I think we once did. Uh, th I think we once did, did. You know, mucking around, did, did that scene from uh, Day of the Daleks. Uh, you shouldn't be. Hit. We can't have two of us running about. That's what. Don't worry. I think we did, we did do that at one stage, over a cup of tea. So um, usually, when impersonators meet each other, it's uh, quite a fascination. We, we swap notes and compare what we've noticed, um, and it's always different. Interpretations are always different which is one of the fascinating things about it, I think. So this morning I've been listening to you uh, with River Song and Alex Kingston. So oh, what's, it, yeah. what's it like blending the uh, new show with the old show? Once again, it's one of the most fascinating things to put the two worlds together. Um, and Alex Kingston has a, a great energy about her. And um, at the Soundhouse Studios and just being opposite her, just just watching her perform these lines and just bring it to life off the page um, w w was fantastic. She's such a, a positive energy. And to put the brigadier with her, especially at this stage, um, where he has this uh, sense of, um, I'm sorry, but who are you? And there is this, um, there's a curiosity there and there's a, and it, you you can sense River Song's characters just just having fun being back in this era, knowing how she'll be making them think, really making them be surprised. And what is it is you can just she brings an energy of relishing that sort of feeling. And um, I think the the lovely thing about um, River Song's character, I think. We remember that speech that the Tenth Doctor gave, where we were hearing more uh, about the, the sadness that you would feel if you're a Time Lord. Your companions, the, the people you know and love, they they come and go. You live forever, but your companions they they fade and they die and they go. And what a curse for a Time Lord! What that, that's probably a Time Lord's amongst their greatest sadnesses. So it's good for the Doctor that here is one companion who is more constant and who does stay by his side over a much longer time. It's, it's a comfort for the Doctor, which um, it, it, it's nice to know that's there for the Doctor. 
How have you found working in lockdown compared to working in studio? There's many more remote recordings. Yes, what I've always done, Sarah Jane, improvise. Uh, we just had to improvise a lot more. Uh, remote recordings and, I don't know, the, 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 it, it was good to just pause a little more and just slow down a bit and just, um, just see what you can learn from it, see how you can grow from it. Just a chance to um, let your generosity take flight and be as positive as you can. Um, but yes, remote recording and dealing with glitches and pauses and <laughs> knowing, trying not to be thrown by them. It's just something we've all got used to. We've normalised what we, what we have to do. Sort of makes you feel about how communications might be when Mars has been colonised and, there's, um, and there, there are people living on Mars and the times when you have to talk back to planet Earth. It'll probably be like the Zoom calls of today. Now, I can see you've got a lot more in the can already because already announced the Stranded episodes. There's, assuming, more robots to come. We didn't talk about the robots along the way, but you've been playing a lot of important roles in robots. You've got Chris Eccleston coming up. So, aside from all your big finish work that you're still obviously doing, um, what, what else is in, in store for you? Um, well, we've got... Um, we're doing our Dead Ringers uh, topical comedy Christmas shows. In a few weeks' time, um, I'm doing a stage play in Scotland in the first part of next year, uh, where I'm playing the uh, the talent show ho uh, host Huey Green. It's your last chance to dance in tra <laughs> that sort of Canadian game show accent. So uh, I'm I'm doing that. O also, yes, I, I I seem to have created a Christmas record, which. Um, a record label have taken and it seems to be a Christmas single. Um, for many, many years, I, it always seemed to me there was loads of festive tunes, you know, Band-Aid, Slade, um, Wizard and all of these. But come Christmas Day evening at about eight o'clock, they just sort of stopped and felt out of date. And I remember when I was a DJ, age 19, when I had to do cover on Red Rose Radio from Boxing Day all the way up to New Year's Eve, I thought, there isn't a festive tune that covers this period, this funny little week between Christmas and New Year. So um, for, for ages, I thought, I'm going to try and write one. And uh, anyway, this, um, this uh, record label type organisation have taken it on and it's, it's got to be a Christmas record, which is... Slightly bizarre, but, you know, try something new, eh? So what's that called? Uh, I created a band name. The, the band name is Turkey Curry, because that's probably what people tend to eat between Christmas and New Year. Uh, and the title of the song is This Time In Between. This Time In Between by Turkey Curry. And uh, as my cousin Martin, who's 84, said, I'll tell you what, it's easy to whistle. I'll give you that. <laughs> There's a few uh, traditions in Australia that we look at you guys in the UK, which we don't have at all. So the Christmas album is not a thing at all out here. But of course, you know, it's a huge thing over there. Um, the pantomime, we don't do pantomimes out here. So it's, 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 it's always fun to watch what's going on over there. <laughs> I think, whoa, that's, yeah. And, you know, we, you know, films like Love Actually, where the, the Christmas album becomes a major plot device. So, yeah, well, well, well good luck with your album. I hope it hits number one. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's always good to do something random uh, now and again, isn't it? It's, it's certainly that, yes. I hope it'll be my version of I Cross the Void Beyond the Mind. <laughs> I hope it'll be that. Well, listen, John, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Um, oh, we, yeah. we, we have been loving your work for years, and all the more so, and the fact that you are bringing back characters that we've loved. Um, there was a, it was interesting, there's a long feeling in terms of once we lost certain actors, we'd lost their stories. But because, yeah. of, because of people like you, you're actually allowing stories to return. So thank you for bringing the stories back to the fans. Oh, we, we appreciate it. No, I, I appreciate you saying. And um, yeah, you just want to create the feeling of how they made you feel when you first watched them. Um, and to, to do that, I, I hope that's a great testament that we can pay to these great, great actors and their wonderful characters. From Big Finish Productions, The Third Doctor. Volume 8
Conspiracy in Space. Could it be City Stardust jamming with the spiders on Mars? Don't be absurd, Joe. Dare you place a claw on the hilt of your sword? I am the Lady Zin, Dowager of the Jade Chordata. As a matter of fact, I know exactly where we are. Well, it's not the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, is it? An Earth female? She may be diseased. Draconian guards? Doctor, we're on Draconia. That would seem to be the obvious conclusion. <laughs> and may the words choke in my windpipe like a half-digested mammalian. Three... Two, one, and chokes away! Eyes must intercept and kill. The young emperor is not beholden to anything said in haste. To place, place myself, myself henceforth, henceforth on, on his Draconian, Draconian Majesty's, Majesty's secret, secret service. service. Aren't you a little short for Draconian? I think they're going to ram us. Look out! Intercept and kill. Hey! <laughs> Devil's Hoof Prints. I've waited such a long time for this. Doctor, come out and look. Ah, interesting. <gasps> what was that? Relax. Mr. Chilton, we're ready. Yes, good. Submerge the superconductor coils and activate circuits one through four. <laughs> <laughs> it works. It works! Oh, if the famous ghost doesn't get you, it looks like a nice spot for a picnic. He's meant to be a sprite or spirit that haunts the tour, and he's only ever seen in the coldest winters. Doctor! Miss Smith! Over here! Ah, there he is. Why has Unit been called in? This isn't a holiday, Doctor. Yes, well, it couldn't be helped, old chap. Doctor! Get down! I am at will! <laughs> for pity's sake, man! Reverse the polarity before it's too late. You'll find I'm in charge here, Doctor. Chilton must be insane. Have we ever met? Not to my knowledge. How odd. I almost feel as though we have. I'm sure I would have remembered. Yes, quite. The Wild Hunt. Big finish. We love stories. Well, Philip, that was quite a thrill to talk with the man of a thousand voices. Reckon there was only a, a few hundred, but no, nah, a few hundred to me is virtually a thousand. It's a million. <laughs> it, it is something that I've always wanted to do: is to be able to change my voice to sound like someone else. Um, you know, I don't particularly like the way I sound anyway. But what an amazing skill it is just to be able to to listen. And, and anyway, we got the idea it was hard work. It's not just something you just can do. He has to listen and spend days getting the ear in right. But what an amazing ability just to be able to work and work and then just be so convincing. Because to be honest, when I, when I listen to him playing Nicholas Courtney now, the Brigadier, um, the stuff that's been released the last couple of days in River Song and the Third Doctor's Adventures, you, you can't tell it's not Nicholas Briggs. I mean, it is just... Nicholas Courtney, you mean? Sorry. I, I can tell quite easily it's not Nicholas Briggs. You're right, because it doesn't <laughs> sound like a Dalek. <laughs> uh, um, if you're kind to me, you'll cut that out, but I don't know whether you'll be kind to me or not now. No, nah, I'm leaving it in. <laughs> <laughs> gee thanks Dwayne, my friend um but you can't tell it's not nicholas courtney because it is just so a accurate and so you know it it's lovely having people like sadie miller um and daisy ashford playing you know the roles their mother played and you know and, and you're certainly seeing more and more hearing more and more of the timber of their parents in their voices sadie in particular yeah. is getting a lot of sarah jane out but it's not like this is the spot on impersonation that um, John's able to do. It, it's just amazing. Yeah, absolutely. So those most recent releases, The Third Doctor Adventures, Volume 8, and The Diary of River Song, New Recruit. Which volume is that? That's a volume nine, is it? Uh, I'm pretty sure it's a nine. I think it might be. So both I've finished both of them now, and they're both sensational, great writers. Um, yeah, it's volume nine. Follow, follow um, our tweets. I've been tweeting along. I'm about to tweet. Some, some comments about all the river song in the next day or so. Cool. No, excellent. But before we finish today, we're going to do our regular recommendations. And guess what, Philip? Whose turn is it, Dwayne? It's your turn. Oh, well, there you go. Um, I'm going to recommend something we talked about during the podcast, which just reminded me how much I loved it. And that's The Five Doctors by Terence Dix, read by John Coleshaw. 
Mm. It's amazing. Uh, it, it was really the piece of work that I realised how astounding he was because he brings so many of the characters just to life. I mean, there's a few characters he doesn't do perfectly, but there are so many voices in there, and it's just, it's almost creepy as he's reading the dialogue of different characters. And he just, I mean, as he said, he loved the show when he was a kid. He's, it's one of his go-to programs. It's one of my go-to programs too. Um, but to hear him doing all those voices, it's just sensational. So, highly recommend. Um, I, I don't know how, how many of you listen to the audiobooks, by the target audiobooks. I really love them. I think they're sensational. They're, um, a, they're a good way to experience the TV episodes slightly differently. Uh, and they don't go for too much longer because Uncle Terry didn't write, uh, you know, epics. Let's put it that way. So, uh, but like John Colshaw's just said, that uh, he he wrote in such a way. I can't remember the exact wording that she used. I might that that, that she used. I can't remember the exact wording that he used. See, I edit myself, Philip. But I, don't uh, edit yeah, I, I bet you cut that out. <laughs> oh, I've got to leave it in now. I've got to leave it in. <laughs> Um, yeah, so he's got this sort of shorthand way of uh, of getting those stories down in novel form, but also makes it really enjoyable for actors like John Colshaw to perform, and great for the listener too. Uh, and I love the, all their reissues that they're doing, the target novelizations with with the added music, sound effects, things like that. Really enhances the enjoyment of those classic episodes. I mean. They're doing a great job at letting at getting us to invest in these stories over and over and over again, and I'm doing it willingly. Yeah, they do. I'm even getting you know, I'm getting my son to sit down with the novel and you know read along as it's being read. Okay, as, you know part of his part of his reading practice and things. So yeah, they're great educational benefits there as well. So what about you, Dwayne? What have you been listening to? Okay, a little bit of uh, excitement for me this week on the music scene because one of my favorite bands of all time after 11 years, 11, 12 years, I think 12 years by the time the album comes out, they've announced a new album next year. And this band is close to me because like John said, his his first work was in community radio. So he was working in a hospital radio station. I worked for 10 years in community radio in Hobart. It's quite a large community station actually. Uh, but I was there for 10 years. And one of the bands I constantly promoted was a band called Porcupine Tree. Um, you'll love them, Philip. You will. Oh, I know I will. I always do. <laughs> I know you're going to listen to them as soon as we finish here tonight. I am. But I'm looking, looking up now. It's just been announced a new album's coming out next year. Um, and a, a single has been released. It was released on the 1st of November. So I've been listening to it quite quite a lot since uh, since Monday. And uh, it's called uh, Harridan is the name of the single. So Porcupine, just look up Porcupine Tree on Spotify and you'll be able to you'll be able to see that. It's on YouTube as well. I'll put links for that in the show notes. You can check out what I'm raving about. Uh, Stephen Wilson is the man behind Porcupine uh, okay, Tree. Oh, makes sense. So I have, oh, you've, you remember Stephen Wilson's name? Uh, yes, you've mentioned him before. Once or twice. You have. <laughs> very, so, exactly. very, very big in the music scene, particularly with our mates over at Prog to Who. Well, I, I'm I'm hanging out for the new ABBA release tomorrow, so the rest of the ABBA album gets released. So that's- you have just killed my conversation. <laughs> You've just killed it. You want chalk and cheese? You put ABBA and Porcupine Tree together, and you'll that's what you'll get. But they're still both good. But I don't know why you mentioned ABBA in the same breath as PT. But anyway, <laughs> all right, that's it for this time. I hope you enjoyed it. We certainly did, and we'll be back soon for another instalment of the Sirens of Audio. See you, Philip. See you, everybody. See you, everyone. Bye. This has been the Sirens of Audio, episode 81, First Impressions, with our special guest, John Colshaw, and your hosts, Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Theme music by the Jackpot Golden Boys. Our email address is sirensofaudio at gmail.com. Be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube and your favourite podcast app. Find links to all our socials and other info at sirensofaudio.com. Now, when choosing your entertainment, beware of cheap imitations. Just go and buy some quality audio drama, you mug. Because audio drama 